when there's no one else making noise, and you scan your life and compare it to the Word, you know that it's nothing but grace <coughs> and grace alone. Now, John Calvin writes, and I love this statement, they are contented to ascribe their salvation to the unmerited goodness of God as the alone cause of it. Now, they are contented to ascribe their salvation to the goodness of God. They have learned, they have been trained, that it is all of God, but they have become content in that. Now we should never seek striving to be holy. We should never seek striving to be more and more like Christ, to have more virtue, to have more merit. But there's another sense though, as we grow, we are going to be content in Him and content in the fact that all our salvation springs forth from Him and from His mercy and His grace. And we begin to say with the psalmist, unto Thee be the glory. Only unto Thee. Not unto me. Unto Thee. And we're content with it. That's why the true believer that has grown something in maturity and been instructed will never have a problem with God doing everything for His own glory. He'll never have a problem with that. It's a reality in his life, but also, after the many years of failure, he sees that it's a necessity. If God does anything based upon what I deserve, there is no hope whatsoever. Now, fallen man's only ground for any appeal for salvation or deliverance is God's character and willingness to save. Now, I specifically put character in there along with willingness. And, and there's a reason. In our day and age, we speak a great deal about will. The will of God or the will of men. But we do not realize that in both cases, will has everything to do with character. We say that God made a decision on our behalf. And that's a wonderful, true statement. But He made that decision on our behalf because of who He is. And that is why it's just not good enough to know His will. It's just not good enough to know His will. Because in many cases, it seems clouded and you won't understand it. His will can seem harsh. His will can seem wrong. Unless you understand His character. If it is the will of God you suffer, that may cause you to pout. To condemn and accuse God for wrongdoing. But if you know God's character, then in the midst of His will for you to suffer, you can rejoice because you know there's purpose and there's goodness behind it. And we take that on to deal with men. Talking about the will of men, the will of men, the free will of man, the free will, free will. Man is free. Okay, I'll play your game. Man has free will. Problem is he doesn't have good will. He's free to follow his will. But his will springs forth from a corrupt nature. You see. And that's why salvation is more than just a changing of the will. Because it's impossible to change the will apart from character. And so salvation has more to do with changing the person. And then that person's <coughs> will is changed. It has to do with character. Now, let's go on. But beyond divine love and free grace... There is simply no reason for a righteous God to procure the salvation of the wicked. You can go ahead if you want and attribute salvation to something else, but you're cutting the limb out from under you. 
You're cutting the limb out from under you. If you want salvation to be for another reason, specifically a reason that springs forth from you, you've just destroyed any hope of salvation because there is nothing in you. Now, Jonathan Edwards writes, And here it may be observed, after what a remarkable manner God speaks of His love to the children of Israel in the wilderness, as though His love were for love's sake, and His goodness were its own end and motive. I would say he's right. Remember, we go back to Deuteronomy. Why has God loved Israel? I've loved thee because I've loved thee. I'm good to thee because I'm good. Matthew Henry writes, We depend upon the goodness of thy nature, which is the glory of thy name. And he quotes Exodus 34, 6, where the name of God is proclaimed. And in that there's goodness and compassion. He's slow to wrath. He's merciful. Above here from, from Barnes, up in the top of the page, he makes a comment on Psalms 44, 26. Rise up, be our help, and redeem us for the sake of your loving kindness. It was not primarily or mainly on their account that the psalmist urges his prayer. It was that the character of God might be made known or that it might be seen that He was a merciful being. Why? What is His motive for praying? That it might go right necessarily with Israel? What's the foundation of His praying? That Israel merits redemption? No. No. It all has to do with the character of God and God being revealed. The proper manifestation of the divine character as showing what God is, is in itself of no, more importance than our personal salvation. Let's read that again. The proper manifestation of the divine character as showing what God is, is in itself of more importance than our personal salvation. This takes me back to the Lord's Prayer, commonly called. And if you compare the Lord's Prayer to most praying, you find there's a great discrepancy. Thy name. What is the reason for all praying? For everything you ask of God, what is the primary reason that your name be hallowed, that it be considered unique, holy, special, transcendent, above everything else? That thy name be hallowed, that thy kingdom come, that thy will be done. So that if a man is sick, because of his sickness, he can cry out to the Lord, Lord, heal me. But the background, the aim, the thing he's shooting for, is basically this in the back of his mind. If your name will be held in higher esteem, and your kingdom will come in a greater way, and your will be done in a more complete fashion, then heal me. But if by crushing me, your name is hallowed in a greater way, your kingdom advances, and your will is done in a more complete fashion, crush me. This is not about us primarily, although it is about us. But secondarily, it is about His will. His will. Prayer is the means. One of the means that God has ordained for advancing His glory. And that sets up higher as a, as a motive and a reason than our temporal need. 
Now people will have problems with that only until they understand that God is good and whatever God wills for us is the best. And that to God eternity is more important than the temporal. And true holiness is more important than fleeting happiness. Now, goes on and he says this, for the, wel the welfare of the universe depends on that. And the highest hope which we can have as sinners when we come before him is that he would glorify himself in his mercy. 